My name is Kelly Gage, and I am Chief Strategy Officer at Commerce Tools. And in my session, I'm going to be explaining why GraphQL is the glue for composable commerce. A little bit of background on me. Um, I started my career with ATG, which was the leading commerce platform back in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, at ATG, I actually spent three and a half years as uh, Walmart's chief ATG architect. So that was a fun couple of years and really learned uh, the commerce side of the business. And then I joined Oracle um, and that was uh, my wife and I had our first child and I, I couldn't be traveling every week. And the prospect of living in a Dayton, Ohio, um, uh, Hilton uh, Express at the airport uh, didn't appeal to me. Kind of wanted to be home a little bit, and uh, Oracle offered me a, a position where I could commute to an office. So that was nice, and uh, spent five years there. I was a product manager for some of their cloud initiatives, um, for um, microservices, um, you know, a lot of uh, different early cloud initiatives there. And I, I very much enjoyed uh, learning the business side of software. Um, I also wrote e-commerce in the cloud there for O'Reilly. And then I've been at Commerce Tools for a little over six years. I am uh, I was chief product officer for almost six, and now I am doing this amorphous thing called strategy. Um, I've also co-founded the Mock Alliance and ran it for the first year. And I've written three more books, and my last book being GraphQL for Modern Commerce. So I love the intersection of commerce and tech. And in the session, I'll be explaining why GraphQL is the glue for composable commerce. All right, so let's look at REST. Um, REST is fantastic. Um, REST is what uh, Commerce Tools was built on. It's what most of the modern internet was built on. It's a means of exchanging data, basically. It's, a, it's, it's not even a protocol necessarily. It's a set of um, principles, if you want to call it that. And fundamentally, you have an endpoint and an endpoint exposes some data or some functionality, and you have uh, multiple clients. And a client could be a web app, it could be a mobile app, uh, which is native or web, it could be a button, it could be a kiosk, it could be just about anything. But you have a client, and it makes an HTTP request for something, and it hits an endpoint, and you get that thing back. So pretty straightforward. And at least on the surface, this looks perfect. Um, and for very simple use cases, it is perfect. But you start ending up with challenges very quickly. So this is a quote from Roy Fielding. And in his uh, 2000, I believe it was 2000 or 2001. I can never remember the exact date. I think it was like January of 2001. Um, in his PhD dissertation, where he outlined um, REST APIs, it, there's this uh, quote actually in there where he said, I am getting frustrated by the number of people calling any HTTP based interface a REST API. So that was one of the, you know, subsequent as he's amended it over the years, that was one of the, the comments that he's heard um, about REST. And it's true. People just expose anything and they call it over HTTP and magically everybody calls that a REST API. But it's not. It's REST is a very distinct standard and the highest form of, uh, of, of APIs. So next, let's go into composable commerce because that has a very distinctive meaning as well. And it's, it's in the title of this talk, right? Um, so in our world, in the commerce space, you have all these nice, uh, clean, discrete microservices. And you'd have microservices for things like pricing, for product catalog, for promotions. You have all these nice pieces. And each of those pieces, those microservices, is exposing a REST API. And the goal in Composable Commerce is to build a catalog of these REST APIs. And some of them you're going to build, some of them you're going to buy from third parties. Um, but bottom line is you're assembling a catalog of these things. And then you have your multiple clients calling into the respective REST APIs, which then sit on top of the microservices. And let's go into some of the issues uh, with uh, composable commerce and REST. The first issue you have is overfetching. So this is a very standard product detail page for 
a mobile web app or maybe for an Apple watch, right? It's a very simple, um, you're just getting the display name, you're getting a product image, you're getting a price and reviews. Um, and that works just fine, right? Overfetching um, in this case is uh, is a challenge because if you're just displaying this information, the front end only needs a couple bits of data, but when you retrieve everything, you're getting back literally hundreds of fields sometimes. Um, a desktop version of this might require all of those fields and everything might be presented. But if you're just making a request over a simple, nice, clean, um, you know, um, mobile web app experience like this, you don't need all of that stuff. So you end up getting too much stuff back. And again, easy for the front end, right? You just discard it, but there's a network overhead there. And that, that causes a, a lot of challenges, especially in low bandwidth, high latency environments. Um, the next issue you have is under fetching, and this is a bit harder to explain, um, but let me try. So uh, if you want to go to an uh, order uh, history page, right? Um, you want to look at the previous orders you've placed. Um, everything in commerce uh, has references. It's very graph um, orientated behind the scenes. So you have to make a request from the client and then you have to call the customer orders API. And then once you have a list of the order IDs, you then need to call the orders API and retrieve the overall structure of each order. And then within each um, order, you have a number of products or you have shipping status or you have SKUs or you have all of these different things that can be inside an order. And then you then have to call uh, the shipping status API or the customer API or the product API. But point being is, is to render something that looks fairly straightforward, that looks like a nice, simple, clean page. You might have to make five, 10, 15 different separate synchronous REST calls to go from your client to another API, to another API, to another API, to another API. And that chaining is done synchronously, um, which is which is very challenging. So you're under fetching data, right? And you don't want one API that just has everything necessarily because now you're duplicating too much data. So you have to get to the systems of record and that requires multiple synchronous parallel queries. There's also a lack of standardization. And I, I got to that in the Roy Fielding quote where a lot of folks just have some type of HTTP endpoint and they magically call it REST, but it's not just REST. Um, REST is a very distinctive meaning as you know, Roy outlined in his uh, famous uh, dissertation. Um, and there are also multiple maturity models as well, even within REST. So you start at the very, very basic level, which is just RPC. It's a level zero and you're just doing RPC calls over HTTP, right? Really, really basic stuff. And you go all the way to uh, level four, which is actually dealing with objects, with responses, with hyperlinks to other objects that are necessary. Um, you also have different data formats. Um, some people use XML and there are different uh, variations of XML. People use JSON, again, different variations of JSON. So you end up creating a lot of complexity and a lot of nuance um, and a lot of challenges and all of that gets pushed to each client. So if you have four or five different clients, you now have four or five different places containing all of that complexity. So that becomes quite challenging to do. Um, and then there's another issue of discoverability, which is what API do I call? Like there's no, in the specification for REST, like there's no outlining discoverability. It's kind of a hole, right? There's no directory service. There's no listing. There's no um, introspection. There's none of that is available. So you kind of have to know which API to call. And in a large enterprise where you have hundreds and hundreds of APIs, that can very quickly become a challenge. You know, imagine you're a, a new web developer working on a you know desktop web app. Now you have to figure out which API to call and that itself can be a challenge. So a lot of folks just revert to having a single wiki page. And in the wiki page, they just list out all of the respective APIs, but you can see how that breaks down pretty quickly if you're not careful. 
So there are a couple ways you can fix this. Um, the first way you can fix this is you can call each API separately. So you have to know which API to call, which that's assuming you fix the discovery problem. Um, and you just call the API synchronously and that works. Um, I would say there are challenges with performance. Um, you have to deal with overfetching and underfetching data. Um, you have to deal with um, synchronously chaining together multiple calls and that becomes a little fragile sometimes, but it works. It works just fine. Um, technically it's, it's, it's a little inefficient, but it, it functions. Um, another approach is to build an aggregator, and sometimes these are called backends for front ends. So in this model, you know, let's go back to that um, product detail example where you're listing the orders that have been placed. Um, and then within each order, you're listing the products, the details, things like that. Um, you can build a microservice, which is called like the you know, customer order detail microservice, basically something like that. And anytime a customer or order or product gets changed, it publishes an event and that single aggregator then is responsible for collecting those details, collecting those updates. And you're just presenting back whatever cached information that aggregator microservice has. The obvious downside of this is now you have so many different aggregators. It, it becomes a lot of a, a sprawl it becomes challenging. So you have an aggregator for a web app. You have a, an aggregator for the um, kiosk in a physical store because each one of these requires its own details, its own set of attributes, its own performance characteristics. So for each page, right? If you want to call these things pages or for each function, if you want to call them a function, you end up with you know, one of these aggregator things for every single microservice or for every, um, every single client you have. And typically folks have two, three, four, four of them, right? Like that becomes quite challenging because now you have four different copies of this code, each returning slightly different attributes back to the client. And that's not a very good way to run things. Um, but it, again, it works. There are folks who do it. It's, it's functional. All right, so now that we've talked about the uh, challenges with REST and some ways that people get around them, um, I'd like to slowly introduce GraphQL. And to understand GraphQL, you have to understand the graph part of GraphQL, right? Um, graphs are everywhere in real life. So social networks, for example, are a great um, uh, example of a graph. Um, you go to LinkedIn, for example, and it'll tell you that, uh, this person's a second degree connection or a third degree connection. That's just a graph, right? They're telling you how many connections you have in common, um, flight routes. That's another great example where you have these hubs in the middle and you have all of these spokes that come out of each hub. Um, you know, think of public transit maps in a city, you know, train or subway system. Those are all graphs. So anytime you have nodes, you have connections between the nodes. Now you have a graph and there's a whole line of computer science that opens up when you do that. Um, GraphQL um, is a query language, hence the QL for uh, query language for graphs. And if, if you really want to think about it, GraphQL is almost like, and I know some people in the community hate when uh, folks say this, but think of it as SQL, um, but for your clients. So with GraphQL, you make a single query, and this is a very, very rudimentary query here. And you say for this product, or right, in this case, it's 1001, I'd like to retrieve the icon URL, the name, price, availability, right? And you put down as a client-side developer what you want to retrieve. And then you make that request over HTTP to the server, the GraphQL server, the GraphQL server will then go and call each of the respective APIs. And it's doing all that from the server side. So behind the scenes, you might be hitting 10 different APIs, but you're doing it within a zero latency cloud infrastructure. So client calls to the server, the server then calls to the respective APIs. 
And on the server side then, right, you're not dealing with any bandwidth constraints, latency constraints, nothing, processing constraints. Um, it can do all of the filtering. It can do overfetching, underfetching. It can do anything you want. And the client then gets back a single, nice, clean JSON response with exactly precisely the data that's required. Um, so they don't have to, the clients don't have to deal with authentication, with authorization, underfetching, overfetching, um, differences in XML standards, differences in JSON standards. Um, very, very, very simple um, for client developers. And really with GraphQL, you're optimizing for client side changeability. So that's all great. Um, and it solves quite a few problems. Um, it doesn't really make any new problems besides having now this additional layer. But now you can have multiple clients all iterating in parallel to work through these respective um, queries. So you're optimizing for client side performance and client side um, ability to make changes on the fly. Um, and that's all great. You want everything to be on the server side if possible. Um, GraphQL actually came out of Facebook. So they had a challenge that many folks in the industry have. They had a bunch of different applications and they wanted to standardize and they built this thing. I think they called it super graph, if I'm not mistaken, back in the day. And it was basically the, the precursor to GraphQL. Um, so they did that from 2012 to 2015. They released the specification publicly in 2015 and they maintained control until 2017. And then they outsourced um, or they uh, donated it to the newly created GraphQL Foundation, um, which is now a fully um, uh, operating chapter of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So that's a pretty big deal. And let's go through a little bit more in detail what the request would be and what the response would be. So with an input here, you have an operand, which is a query, right? And you can do other things as well. Um, you know, you can uh, perform any CRUD operation through GraphQL basically. And then this is the actual query, right? And in this case, we've defined it as product, but it could be just about anything you want. You know, it could be customer orders. It could be, um, you know, customer uh, profile. It could be, you name the query, how you want to define that query. And then you can have one or more arguments that you pass to the query. In this case, again, very simple, but it could also be a search thing. It could, you could have a query for products whose um, display name contains red and any product with a display name of red would then come back in that response. And then you can retrieve here th things like field names, for example. And in this case, we're trying to retrieve the category name of that product. And this is how the response would come back. So you have a JSON response sent over HTTP and you would have data as being the standard response, right? That's part of the specification. And then for this query, this is the category and this is its name. So very, very simple, very easy for clients to figure that out. You give them a GraphQL endpoint and maybe you give them something like Apollo and they can do the rest from there. Really straightforward. And GraphQL, I want to make it very clear that GraphQL works on top of REST as a support of REST. It does not replace REST and we don't want it to replace REST. REST is what the individual microservices or application developers expose out to the world. Nice, clean, well-defined APIs. GraphQL makes it really easy to consume lots of different APIs from many different clients. So with REST, think of REST as the source of GraphQL, the source of authoritative information for GraphQL. So query goes to GraphQL server, server then calls the respective REST APIs. And the specification is just that, it's a specification. Um, it's 216 pages, if you were to print it out. It goes into extensive detail, um, mind-numbing detail, which is probably a good thing in a specification. But things like in insignificant commas, there are multiple pages on that. Um, ignored tokens, 
There are all sorts of details there. And the point of having a really, really clear, well-defined specification is that anybody implementing that specification on the client side or server side can very um, quickly and easily achieve interoperability between vendors. You don't want what happened with REST, where everybody goes out and does their own thing. They all have their own dialogue, their dialect, and it becomes really um, it becomes really difficult to work across multiple REST API vendors. GraphQL, because the specification is so rigid, um, it's very very easy to switch between servers, between clients. Everything is very interoperable. There are some things that are deliberately left out. There are some things that are deliberately left out. So clients, for example, are completely left out of the specification, um, how that works. Um, it could be just something as simple as a, a, a curl call off of a command line, um, really straightforward on the client side, or it can be something as complex as a full Apollo client, which makes the most commonly used client out there. Um, there's nothing out there about combining schemas either. And when you have multiple GraphQL schemas, you run into the same problem you have with REST APIs. So imagine you're out there with commerce tools and you go out and then get content stack or contentful and amplians. I'm just making up names here. Um, you know, commonly used uh, CMSs in our space. Each of those vendors has their own GraphQL uh, endpoint. And what you don't want is for client developers to have to call the commerce tools, GraphQL endpoint for anything commerce related, but then go to a completely separate uh, GraphQL endpoint for anything content related or anything search related for, for that matter. Um, it's important that uh, clients have a very simple experience. And that's part of the value add of commercial servers and commercial clients like Apollo they will allow you to combine multiple schemas in one. So they have their own server, and then you plug in the uh, commerce GraphQL endpoint, and you plug in the content GraphQL endpoint, and now you can suddenly have a query that spans both of them. Um, there's also nothing in there about security, um, and that's uh, primarily due to um, commercial vendors, and it's a good area for them to provide differentiation. And finally, caching. And I, I would love to see caching as part of the next GraphQL spec, um, but there's nothing in there today about how you cache um, responses. But generally, it's a really nice, clean, well-defined specification. I think it's really a model for how specifications should be built. And um, finally, uh, GraphQL's superpower is, is its graph orientation. So you can define a type. A type is a noun. It's a customer. It's an order, something like that. And you can say customer.orders. And so that will retrieve all the orders for a customer. Or you could say order.customer, which is retrieving the customer who placed a single order. So you can very uh, quickly jump around a graph and get as complicated as you please. It's all graph um, oriented behind the scenes. And that's especially applicable to e-commerce where you have things like customers and orders and products, and all of them have very complex um, relationships with each other. So GraphQL is uniquely well-suited to uh, this type of environment. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this is a good explanation of how GraphQL is the glue for composable commerce.